Hey there. Good morning. It is uh, Saturday morning, the 17th of April. Um, I'm outside this morning. It's uh, it's cool out here, but I needed a, a change of scenery. Um, but it's kind of cloudy, kind of cool, but uh, it's kind of invigorating to be outside a little bit this morning. It's going to be a pretty day a little bit later on, uh, but welcome to the Morning Watch. Uh, this is a, a special Saturday edition of the Morning Watch uh, in order to get Mark wrapped up so that we can start Monday fresh with the book of Acts. We're going to skip Luke and John and come back to them a little bit later on. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't done a lot of study in the book of Acts, so I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting to open that up with you and learn about what the Lord did uh, in that early church. Um the original title of the book of Acts was the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really more of Acts of Jesus, right? Um, and uh, how he built that early church. So as you come in this morning, let us know you're here. Um, kind of know who's who's with us this morning. So today we're going to be in Mark chapter 16, the last chapter of the book of Mark. And um, it's it's interesting when you think about if, if you if you if you've looked at Mark 16 this morning. You're going to see something interesting. It's one of the the, the mysteries of God's word that is just so compelling. Um, the book actually, the chapter actually ends with verse number eight. Um, but if you're um, all the modern translations continue on with verses nine through twenty, those are actually um, were not part of the original manuscript. Um, the original manuscript um, from the early, early days um, of, um, of the millennia uh, stopped at verse 8. But some, it, it's very abrupt, right? It stops very quickly uh, there in verse 8. And it's almost like the scribes were like, we need something more. So they added a few more verses in to kind of give some resolution to Mark chapter 8, but it's it's kind of cool. You can even think a little bit about the fact that it's open-ended because it's open-ended for you and I, right? Um, today's about the resurrection, and you start thinking about what does, the, what does the resurrection of Jesus mean to you as a follower of Christ? Um, it is everything to us. You know, we celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday, which is a glorious affair and something we should definitely do. But the resurrection is an everyday thing for us as believers. It is the thing through which we draw our strength uh, and our resolve. The resurrection is the anchor that we have as followers of Christ. Um, so yeah, and John Mark was not a witness to these things. He wrote down what Peter told him. And Peter was there for everything. <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting to consider all of these things. Let's have a word of prayer. Just want to please ask that you pray for a couple of families. Um, the family of, of Debbie Burns. Um, Debbie lost her battle to cancer this morning early about eight o'clock. Uh, please pray for Daryl and Tammy and uh, Debbie's mom, Drusy, and her friends there on the creek. Uh, please pray for them. And then also my cousin Ernest um, uh, passed away uh, yesterday. And so they're in London. So please pray for his wife, Marshall, and his kids, Calvin and Vonnie and Elaine, um, his, his, his brother and sister and, and his whole family. Please pray for them. His grandson, Brandon, please pray for them. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the, the privilege that we have to come into your presence this morning and study your word together. Thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that as I see here on the on the front porch, I can hear the birds. I can um, I can hear the interstate behind me, people going to and fro um, with uh, with lives, and you don't we're not really sure where they're going or why they're going or or whatever. But Lord, we just we just pray that you're here with us in our midst. You tell us in your word that when two or more gathered in your name, that you are there with them. And so, Lord, we know that you're with us this morning, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful that the hope that we have in your Son is real, and it is not some 
It is not some myth. It is real. And we can hold our lives firmly on the rock that is your son and that is the gospel. Lord, thank you for the resurrection that we're going to be reading about this morning. Because, Lord, we know that you are alive today. We know that you are not dead, that that tomb is empty. And that is the linchpin on which everything that we are and do stands. Lord, thank you. And we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We've got 12 people. Um, something must be wrong in the comments this morning. I don't see anybody saying anything. Um, if you're here, say something. If not, I want to see if we can if you can see me on the. I, I'm, I think you're. I think you're here. I, I see that you're here. Yeah, good. So people are here. Good. Yeah. Oh yeah. If not, I want to see. Yeah. I'm so I'm on my phone and here. So I can't see the comments on my on my surface, but I can see it on my phone. So who's so here? Kim and Crystal. Kim, Wilma. Happy birthday, Wilma. Robin. Rosemary, uh, yeah, please pray for the family of, of my sweet friend June Delph. June, um, June has been a member of our church for a long, long time, and one of our senior saints in our church, she passed away yesterday uh, unexpectedly, and so please pray for, um, please pray for for June's family. Just to, her and Floyd were just. Anchors, anchors at Central Baptist Church. Yeah, it's always so kind to. Me. June was always so kind to me, um, and many, 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 many others, countless others. All right, let's read Mark chapter sixteen. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary of the mother of James and Salome, went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise. They went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll the stone away from us, for us, from the entrance to the tomb? Because they wanted to go in. They wanted to go in and see his body. They wanted to go in, and there was no embalming in these days. And so they would treat the body with spices and oils to help preserve it. And so they're like, who's going to move that rock away? How are we going to get in there? But when they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. Something's going on here, right? When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. Who is this guy? The women were shocked, but the angel, that's who this is. The angel said, don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see them there just as he told you before he died. So here's this angel sitting inside the tomb. And uh, these, these women were, were afraid. They were because this was not what they expected. You know, following Jesus oftentimes means that things happen to you that are unexpected. Unexpected mysteries, unexpected joys, sometimes hardships. Jesus said, the world hated me, they're going to hate you. So there are difficulties that come with being a follower of Christ. The Bible tells us and instructs us to, to count the cost, to take up our cross. Galatians said, for I have been crucified with Christ. But this is an amazing thing. Here sits this angel where Jesus was laying just a few days before. And so what does the angel tell them? Jesus is not here. He is risen. And I want you to tell the disciples, including Peter. Now remember, Peter is telling Mark what to write. Okay? Mark did not witness these things. But Peter did. And he's telling Mark. Mark is dictating for Peter while Peter is writing. He says, you will see him there just as he told you. I love that, that the angel says, remember, he told you this would happen. This is not, a, this should not be a surprise to you. Verse 8, the women fled from the tomb, probably excited and nervous and anxious all at the same time, right? We've had those moments, right, when we're like, I'm so excited and I'm scared at the same time. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered. 
and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. Now, that's where the original manuscript stopped. That's it. Nothing more. But, like I said, the early, some of these scribes that wrote down the original translations were like, let's add a little more. Now, does that mean that these other verses are not inspired? No, that doesn't mean that. But that was the ending of the manuscript. So, let's read on. It says, Then they briefly reported all this to Peter and his companions. Afterward, Jesus himself sent them out from east to west with the sacred and unfailing message of salvation that gives eternal life. Amen. Verse 9. After Jesus arose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. They did not believe her. It's very interesting, too, that Jesus in his resurrected form first revealed himself and were first made aware of this incredible event that it first came to women. Ancient Bible times were very patriarchal. What does that mean? Very much geared around men. Men being the 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 ruling force. Okay. So it's very telling that Jesus decided not to appear to men, not to not to show himself to men first, but to women. Um, everything Jesus did turned the world up on its end. He turned the idea of the kingdom of God up on its end. He turned the idea of leadership up on its end, of service up on its end. Remember, he said, "I did not come to serve, but I come to I came. I did not came to come to be served, but I came to serve." He turned class structure up on its end. It's amazing. Afterward, verse 12, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. That's the road to Emmaus story, if you remember that. Still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn belief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. Then he told them, listen to this, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages. They'll be able to handle snakes with safety and, they, to, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They'll be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right place of honor at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. And that's the end of Mark. So if you look at that through verses 9 through 20, there's some things in there that don't, that don't really seem like they fit with the rest of the chapter, with the rest of the book. But again, it's here. And we're reading it and we're studying it and we're wrestling through it. And I know this, everything hinges. The Holy Spirit gives us as believers the ability to interpret and be able to understand what Scripture is saying to us. And we'll never understand it all. No, there's no way. In fact, the more we learn about God's Word, the more we realize how little we really understand about it. Right? And which is very... Uh, typical of the Christian experience, right? Because the more we learn about the Lord, the more we learn who he is, the more mysterious he becomes. It's an amazing thing. And so my question to you and to me this morning is what does the resurrection mean to you? What does the resurrection, how does it impact your life on a daily basis? I know in the lives of of uh, of June and her family and Ernest and his family and Debbie and her family all of them were believers all of them were people who had given their hearts and lives to Jesus let me tell you something it means a lot to them it means a lot because the body sa the bible says to be absent with the body is to be present with the lord jesus said i go and prepare a place for you and where I go, I'm going to come back again, and I'm going to get you. Do we believe in the return of Jesus? 
He is alive. He is alive. And today is the day of salvation. Do you know Christ? Have you given your heart and life to him? I hope so. I hope so. Um, in fact, I'm not beyond begging you to. If you do not know him, today is the day to give your heart and life to him. He who gave everything of himself for you. That if we would just put our faith and trust in him, the Bible says he is faithful. God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is exciting. It is so exciting. And so I love this because on Monday, we're going to start talking about this early church and how, you know, Jesus appeared. Guess how many people Jesus appeared to after his resurrection? Over 500 over 500 people saw Jesus in his resurrected body prior to his ascension. This is not some myth. This is real. You know, if you read stories about the early, um, about the apostles, these men who Jesus handpicked to be his guys on the field to spread this word of mercy and grace and forgiveness, um, all of them except for John. And John the writer of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, John Revelation. John was boiled in oil, but survived and ended up meeting his end exiled as an old man on the island of Patmos. But the every other apostle, every single one of them died at the hands of an executioner. And all of them had an opportunity at the end to say, this was all a joke. This, this never happened. This Jesus was a myth. But you know what? They never did. They went. Some of them were hanged. Some of them were crucified. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were, were, were brutally, brutally murdered. All of them were brutally murdered. And yet they had the chance to say, I take it back. And they would not do that. Man, they should give us hope today, right? At least one of them would have said it's a, it's, it didn't happen. But none of them did. None of them did. All of them held to the very end that Jesus is the only way. And I'm telling you this morning, there's no hope in this life apart from Jesus. If you want to go to heaven when you die, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. And please do not think I have all my stuff together because I do not. I am as broken as the worst toy you could ever find. But I'm forgiven. And if you know Jesus this morning, you are forgiven. If you're sitting here right now and you're thinking, you don't, Amen, you don't know what I've done. You, do, you, do, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the life I've lived. There's no way possible that God could ever love me. Let me tell you something. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. He gave his only begotten son through him that if we would just trust in him, we would not perish but have everlasting life. I think about my two daughters, Cassie and Hope. I love them. More than anything in this world. Saying that I wouldn't give them to you. I wouldn't give them to die for you. They mean too much to me. But God gave his only begotten son. Because as John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him. Would not perish but would have everlasting life. What's the resurrection mean to you today? I love you all. Have a great, have a great Saturday. I'm, I got a lot of stuff planned to do today. I got a to-do list that's a mile long, but uh, with God's help, I'll get it done. I love you all. Uh, tomorrow, for those of you who, who follow us in Sunday school, I am teaching Sunday school tomorrow at Central. We are having our lesson, but I'm actually going to be teaching the auditorium class at Central. And so what I will do, instead of it being on my Facebook page, I will get on my Facebook page and share the church's Facebook page so you can watch it there. Okay. Um, I love you all. Have a great Saturday. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your just the power and the mystery and the wonder of your word. Lord, I just pray that if there's any person in this room who is here now, watches it later, stumbles across it on YouTube, that if they have not given their heart to you, that they would today. Today is the day of salvation. We have no guarantee, Lord, of tomorrow. Lord, we love you. And we ask all this in the name of Christ. Amen. I love you all. Have a great Saturday. And uh, we will see you tomorrow for Sunday school, maybe. See you.